be lots of nobbies. Thinking Basketball Podcast, my name is Ben. Welcome back to, uh, we, we made it to the finals. That's all I know. Uh, we've made it to the finals. Cody, I, it was 3 nothing. It was 3 nothing in both series. And everyone started talking about, what are we going to do with this 12-day layoff? What, what European country are we going to vacation to? Jokic is probably, he's, the amount of time he spent with the horses at this point, he probably forgot how to play basketball. And yet, here we are, seven games later, we, we, we went through something, um, and now the finals are two days away. We have a very short amount of time to get this preview done. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to preview this series. We're going to close the book on the wildest, weir- weirdest, was that the weirdest Eastern Conference Finals? You can remember the Heat are back in the finals for the second time in four years. They are in the finals for the sixth time in the last 13 years under Eric Spolstra. They are in the finals for the seventh time in the last 17 years under the Pat Riley regime, the president, El Presidente for life, Heat culture. They have to play the Denver Nuggets who are in the finals for the first time since 1976. When they were in the ABA and our old friend Bobby Jones had to guard Dr. J, Julius Irving for, for the series. Uh, hi, how, how are you doing? Oh, succession ended. Um, all, all sorts of things happened this week. Yeah, Barbie trailer dropped. Like, there's just a lot of things right now that you you giggle. That was the best trailer I've seen. Like, Oppenheimer I, I, was a pretty sick trailer. I, who, but, I don't like watching trailers. It okay. gives away the movie now. I I feel that. I get what you're saying, but, like, it gets me hyped up. Like, I remember, I think it's the 2008 finals before that there must have been, like, a hype video that was maybe played for the Celtics. That's the one that stands out to me. And because of that, it's kind of like getting me prepped for the thing. I don't know. I like trailers because it's like, what narrative things can we pick out to put in there that's going to get you excited about it? Um, But in the old days, Cody, the trailer used to be a teaser to get you excited and now there's a whole cottage industry where they cut the trailer as like a mini movie so mm-hmm. actually the move if, if any if the, for the one percent of people out there who are vibing on what i'm saying about not watching trailers my move is to watch the trailer after you watch the movie because it's like a compressed recap of the film you'll notice that they actually show most of the movie in a two-minute trailer now the full trailer is supposed to be like a mini cut of the movie i think you know when when this stopped is whenever like the voiceover person disappeared. Like whatever happened to the in, in, a, in a land world. in in a land <laughs> in a world where the Celtics can't pull off seven games. Jimmy a, Butler <laughs> faces Nikola Jokic in a land where shooting is impossible. What okay? What do we make of games? What happened in Game Seven? Because I went into it pretty confident. It sounds like what I'm hearing with like people's stories from being there that the Boston Celtics went into it pretty confident. Do you think that the the Tatum ankle injury in the first play of the game where I think it's Gabe Vincent, he lands on, turns his ankle. It didn't look that serious, but it definitely bothered him throughout the game. And in the second half, he comes out and he looks like a baby deer trying to stay in front of people on defense. Like It was clearly just like the complete issue with him physically. Was that like the reverse Willis Reed? Is like Honestly, is that what happened? Did it completely deflate the Celtics before the game? I don't know how much it deflated them. Um I do think it completely changed the game. It, 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 this is what's weird to me about all the Monday morning quarterbacking today. It's like there are some things we can say about the Celtics, and and I do want to talk about uh, primarily the Heat and the Nuggets going forward. But if we if we go to the end of that series, one, the three-point shooting from the role players, they weren't great shots all the time, but there were plenty of good shots that it's like, I had some zero for 27 vibes about, you know what I mean? It's just, why can't these guys make shots? Even, even my wife at some point was like, I don't understand why the Celtics always miss their shots. I thought they weren't that bad of a shooting team. Uh, They're not, but that's one component. Okay. Whether that's fatigue or nerves or variance, I think that's, if you want to have a philosophical conversation about how this works, I've been trying to wrap my head around this as we've only been in this era for five, six, seven years with all these three-pointers, um, more shooters on the court, uh, the, the way the playoff games are played with the switching and the tactical hunting and all this stuff. We can talk about what to make of it because I sometimes I don't know what to make of it. You're watching 
these games and these playoff series, and you're like, now wait a second. I thought Isaac Okoro was like a 30% three-point shooter. He's 0 for 35. I, I just, I don't get it. They're like, gets a lid on a basket. Sometimes you watch other teams. There's a guy who's like a 30% three-point shooter. And he's like, well, it's the playoffs. I'll go five for seven in this game. It's, it's not a big deal. The Heat might have a few of those players on their team. We can have that discussion if you want to have that discussion. But the Jason Tatum thing for the Celtics, I thought it took away their best way of creating offense, a guy who had had a number of huge games in the second half of the series, a number of huge halves that really changed the tenor of each of those games. And his passing and playmaking was getting better and better as he felt more comfortable either against the zone, but usually in man, just understanding where my guys are going to be. How are the Heat playing the passing lanes? Where's Jimmy Butler? I need to be concerned about his, you know, uh, secondary skills, intercepting passes and things like that. They were really dialed in with that. And Tatum is one of the better Game 7 players of all time in NBA history. He's had monster Game 7s, and he came into last night with some crazy Game 7 stats. I want to say like 29 points per game, 60-something percent true shooting. Um, he was plus, I can't remember, I think it was his seventh Game 7, but coming in last night, he was like plus 60 or plus 70 in his minutes on the floor. He, he's just been huge in those games. And he was taken out of the game, essentially, in the first play. So it was weird in that, what was the score after the first quarter? 20 to 15? I, 20, 20, I think Miami got a bucket at the end of the quarter to make it 22 to 15. It was very strange to watch basically both teams feel like they weren't playing well. It wasn't like, oh, all of a sudden we've got the 4 Pistons and the 8 Celtics playing defense. It was more like, this is a weird game. And between the Celtics shooting and Tatum, at a certain point in the game, to me, it felt very, very difficult for them to drum up any offense. They finished the game with a 92 offensive rating, which is 23 points below league average. We were looking at other Game 7s that have ever had performances like that. Like We're talking about like the 2008 Atlanta Hawks against the champion Celtics scoring 66 points in game seven and posting a 70-something offensive rating when the league average is 105. That, that's the level of offensive ineptitude we're talking about for the Celtics. Uh, but then the Heat obviously had Caleb Martin, I think specifically. He, he came to play, as he did so many times in this series. He was four of six from downtown, 26 more points, 10 rebounds, three assists, only missed five shots in the game. Uh, he, you know... He felt like he was out there balling, um, but it was just such a weird, it was a weird game. And uh, here we are. You started this whole thing referencing the the zero for 27. Just just for anyone that doesn't know what Ben's talking about, I think it was the 2018 Western Conference Finals. The Rockets and the Warriors are going there. This is, it looks like the Warriors might be toppled. Like Steph Curry like doesn't score in the first half or something like that. The Rockets missed 27 straight three-pointers it's really surreal to go back and watch that Rockets team miss 27 straight three-pointers so that's what he's referring to when he says that but yeah I think the weird thing about game sevens is I feel like they're often like they're kind of a rock fight like teams kind of come in there a little bit tense they they don't really want to like step outside of their boundaries it kind of feels like teams are like all right we get, don't want to like make the move that's going to make a mistake and allow the other uh, team to come back and Caleb Martin played the role of just like kind of blowing it all open like there were a few times it seemed like the Celtics were bringing it a little bit closer and then Caleb Martin is just ridiculous three or or drives in for a layup or something like that it it honestly reminds me like 2016 game seven of the finals is a really good example of like the fourth quarter where both teams just kind of freeze up but I don't necessarily know if it was like a freezing up it was just like you know I'm not making excuses across the board here but the Celtics were definitely injured like Jason Tatum we talked about the ankle Jalen Brown they've been talking about this I don't know what this hand thing maybe he cut his hand out of vase maybe there's something else going on with this hand Malcolm Brogdon Malcolm Brogdon, who I don't remember which ligament it is that was hurt, but man, Ben, he was just terrible. Like, he he was legitimately just bleeding points away from them. From a guy that during the regular season was like a big driver of their paint-touching ability. And without that, especially with Brown, eight turnovers, it seemed like, like Jimmy Butler was just trying to get Jalen Brown to dribble anywhere near him so he could just pick him off and get some some easy baskets. But really, Ben, it's it sounds silly to be to say that the key to the game was Caleb Martin 
just being completely on fire, especially when you look at the rest of the Heat and you're like, Bam Adebayo couldn't make easy shots. Like, he was getting some some really clear post-ups against small guys and just blowing some hook shots. I don't know. Is it is it that simple to say that it wasn't a very good game and it just took, like, one or two guys to actually go out there and be efficient to win? I'm, well, I, sure, I think in a, in a sort of Monday morning retrospective sense, I think that's what ended up happening, right? I think... You the heat the heat were fifty percent from downtown. They they made half their three pointers. Uh, Caleb Martin made his shots. Jimmy Butler was three for seven from downtown, and the Celtics were twenty one percent from downtown. So, <laughs> you, also by the way, not all game sevens are rock fights, which is what makes this so weird. I went back and looked at game sevens and game fives a couple of years ago, back when it used to be a best of five, and sometimes you get games where it's the end of the series. And everyone is playing very crisp and everyone is playing at a very high level and you don't have a lot of bench minutes and the best players are out there for 42, 45 minutes a game. And you'll get things like we we referenced that 08 Celtics. I know off the top of my head, the game seven they played in the next round against Paul uh, uh, LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers where Pierce and LeBron had that big game seven. I think the offensive ratings in that game were like pushing 120. So it's this weird thing where I think a lot of times we think about the rock fights. Um, and even I wonder, I don't remember, but even that 2016 game with the Cavs and the Warriors, I think the offenses were okay for the first three plus quarters. It just got super, super tight, whether that's pressure or fatigue. I don't know, but I, I'm, I still have no explanation for some of this stuff when it comes to just like guys can't make shots. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if this holds up in the finals because you get a team like Denver, who is not only a really good shooting team, but for my money, the best offensive team going right now. And since we're dealing with the most efficient era of NBA basketball we've ever seen, that means objectively, not relative to the league, but just objectively, we're watching the most efficient offense of all time when we watch the Nuggets. I don't know if a lot of people will think about them that way. Ultimately, we'll see what happens going forward. But that connects to how is Miami going to defend them? How are they How are they going to slow them down? And can a team like that also be subject to some of these wild shooting lulls that we see? I, I, I still don't know what to make of it, Cody, because it feels like Some teams should not be shooting this way, and they are. Is there a style thing where if you're like a 3 and D player, you work really hard defensively, and then you spot up behind the three-point line, and that can get you out of rhythm? Um, Because the Nuggets don't play that way. The Nuggets are more like a a movement inside out, touch the paint, a lot of flowing offense. Even the Warriors, who obviously four championships, six finals, the sort of uh, dynastic team of this decade – they have a lot of shooters and they go through slumps, but it, I don't remember a single point in the last decade with the Warriors feeling like, oh, none of their players can make shots. I don't think that's ever happened. I don't think you ever feel like Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and maybe with the exception of the last series, even Jordan Poole, those those guys, the, even Iguodala, like they, they still make them. So I, I don't know what to make of this very strange, like teams are suddenly shooting 19% from from downtown. I think what's what's going to be so different between the two, obviously a lot of things are going to be different, but when I'm thinking about like the big men that the Heat just faced, right? So Al Horford, I swear last night, Ben, like in, in the short roll, especially because, you know, the, the Heat are running their fun little zone that's just like, it's just the coolest zone in the NBA. It's, it's I know the coolest. Yeah. It is. It's so amorphous and it's so blending in with like kind of man concepts. It's just really fun to watch. But... The Celtics are just trying to get a guy in the middle, right, to make plays there. And Al Horford's a great passer from that short roll area. Get him in the middle of the floor, get him looking around, he's going to pass. But the issue with Al Horford is, like, option A was the catch and, like, touch pass to the corner, right? And he got a few looks for the Celtics that way. Option B for him was to catch, survey for a second, and then kick out for another look. Option C was to maybe take a dribble and then make a kick out, right? Like, Al Horford... The Heat knew wasn't really going to be looking for scoring, right? It He could kind of play more into what Miami wanted to do. And Rob Williams, no, Rob Williams has some chops, but like Rob Williams wants to dive to the basket and throw down some lobs, and he's excellent at it. Jokic, 
I mean, there is no scripted way that he's going to be playing that, right? Like, there's no way that the Heat are going to dictate to Jokic and be like, all right, this is what we want him to do when we're we're running this defensive concept, doing this zone or whatever else. And I think that's going to be really interesting to see how Miami adjusts to that in real time. Because again, Al Horford was doing exactly what they expected him to do every single play. And that's not going to be happening this time around. So, uh, I don't know. It, can, can Miami even run a zone against Jokic? Is Jokic the best zone-busting player in NBA history because I think that's a possibility and I don't really know how they're going to be able to zone him up okay before we talk about the Nuggets and Jokic I think we have to try to contextualize the fact that the Heat are in the finals they were down in the fourth quarter they were trailing in the fourth quarter Cody against the Chicago Bulls in the second play-in game because they had already lost the first play-in game they were in a pseudo single elimination tournament, but they had an extra they had an extra loss to burn. They did that. They came back in the fourth quarter. They won that game. They then knocked off the two seed. Sorry, the one seed. Let me get this straight. They became the eighth seed, even though they're the seventh best record. The one seed Milwaukee Bucks. They knocked off the five seed New York Knicks. And then they knocked off the two seed Celtics. And the Celtics were favored when they were down 2 nothing in the series, having lost two games at home already. Now, whether that's uh, uh, betting sports books, balancing the lines, it's not maybe a true representation of what the current market feels. I don't know. I'm just saying that to point out, is this the greatest run in NBA history? Is it the greatest run in all of basketball History, how do you how do you feel about this? And uh, we have a lot of uh, Heat fans, especially on the YouTube comments. Sometimes I wonder how they feel. Is it is it a, a more grandiose journey if you look at the Heat team and you go, they're actually ten times better than their regular season record. They could have been a one seed. They can take out all the one seeds. That's how good they are. They can defeat multiple one seeds. They're like a sixty win team. That's how good they really are. Caleb Martin's an all-star. Gabe Vincent is this. Bam Adebayo is all NBA. So they're stacked. Or is it more glorious and grandiose that they continuously find a way to overperform like a nine seed making a run through the NCAA tournament or something? And they have done it now for, you have to say four rounds almost, right? They they got out of the play-in. They beat the Bucs. They beat the Knicks. They beat the Celtics. I, it, I'm struggling to... I, I know you don't watch any other sports at all, um, but I'm just struggling to even think of it in other sports, just let alone basketball. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So the thing about the Heat is that last year, I remember when the season ended, right? Or their season ended, I should say. They go to Game 7 against the Celtics. Jimmy Butler... Like, there's the chance that they make the finals. Jimmy Butler hits that pull-up three. Maybe they take the lead. Maybe they sneak in there. Like, there's a possible world where Miami, this is now their second final strip in a row. But at least last year, you could be like, this was the first seed in the East, right? Like, this is a team that did very well in the regular season. You look at a lot of their, their indicators. It's just they weren't healthy and things like that. I just, I don't get the fact that they were so much worse in the regular season. And I, I don't know if it's necessarily the injuries thing. Like, a lot of teams were missing a lot of time with their guys. Ben, I was trying to look at some statistical stuff to try and figure this out exactly, and I was like, all right, how much better is their net rating right now in the playoffs versus their net rating in the regular season, right? And if you take it, I think, I don't know the exact numbers, I think they were like a negative .4 net rating according to play-by-play stats, and I think they're plus four net rating during the playoffs right now, so it's about a plus 4.4 swing. So I didn't have the time to really go and check all of the teams I could think of, but I immediately went back to 1995, and I'm like, huh, I wonder what the Rockets run run was like, because I think they were like a sixth seed or or something like that, making it all the way to win the championship. Their swing from the regular season to the playoffs was only plus 0.7. So the team that I immediately think of as being like the quote-unquote worst regular season team to make it all the way to the finals was actually not that much of a swing from the regular season. So obviously this net rating might and probably will change significantly after the finals, but um, I don't know. I think that would be a starting point for me is I would like to see every finals team and see what the difference is between their playoff net rating and regular season net rating. I, I don't even know if that's the best way to do it. 
But I think that's my long-winded way of saying that it seems like something weird is going on, and I don't know what it is. Well, yeah. I, I mean, that would give you a, a sort of statistical measuring stick, but I'm not sure it's apples to apples because the first team to make the finals as an eight seed was the 1999 New York Knicks. That was a team that acquired Latrell Sprewell during the season. And I'm trying to remember Marcus Camby, he was there the whole year, but he came on at the end of the year. And then uh, Patrick Ewing, of course, got injured in the run. That's where the uh, so-called Ewing theory comes from, by the way. And, and, and Camby took over as a starter. So, there was a lot of it was also the strike uh the lockout shortened season in 1999 where there were only 50 games Th- it was a different thing they 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 played the heat in the first round they beat the heat and then the other the other team that they were able to beat that was very good was the Pacers but even that felt like you know this team just got put together um you know there's some changes from the middle of the season I don't know. It's hard to think of other runs. The 75 Golden State Warriors had a run uh, where, you know, they weren't that good in the regular season. They win the title with young players and they come back the next year. And I think they were the best regular season team by wins and by point differential. But you don't see this a lot in, in basketball with the seven game series where not only do you get multiple upsets, but I, I mean, you know, like we said, they have they have technically played five different opponents since the regular season ended, Cody. They actually lost their game to the Atlanta Hawks. They won their game against the Chicago Bulls barely. And then they went through the Bucks, the Knicks, and the Celtics. Celtics, I mean, that alone is one of the weirdest series maybe I can ever remember where the Heat go up 3 nothing as severe underdogs. And then the Celtics win the next three games. And of course, this sort of like, we haven't even talked since the Derek White shot, which was just one of the craziest, wildest moments to end a game. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, to me, it's been, I think, the most incredible NBA run that I can remember, which to your point, makes it hard, I think, to make sense of in the moment because it's like, what happens, you know, when we get more information as the next series goes on. And as we joke about all the time with the heat, like the nature of the heat sometimes is everyone is sitting on the sideline going, well, I know not to us underestimate them. They're so well coached. They're so tough. They all have these players that can step up in big moments, but I'm going to pick the other team in five or six games and then they just keep winning. Okay. So first of all, game six, Maybe the most chaotic final minute of any NBA game I can think of. Like, if we run through it, Ben, like, Duncan Robinson, before this minute, he hits a couple of really big threes. Like, I think they're dropping against him, and he hits, like, a pull-up three. And then he gets, my guy gets, like, two of the most open three-point looks he's ever going to get. Misses them both. Jimmy Butler gets the, the first of all, he's, like, running to the corner, pull-up three, buries it, and then he gets the pump fake foul on Al Horford, which may or may not have been a foul. I know there's different differing opinions depending on who you talk to, even in the thinking basketball verse, uh, but they go, they check it out, they give him three free throws. Then Marcus Smart takes a shot with, like, three seconds left. Derek White's, but I, I just, wait, I can't. Wait, 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 you forgot, you forgot that the Celtics had to challenge, which is what allowed the time to be put back on the clock. And that, that always confuses me, by the way, like the rest of the game, even even when we're down in the final minute and like tenths of a second are up, the foul is not, the whistle is not called at the exact moment of the foul. So the you shoot the ball, there's a foul. The clock will always stop a half a second or a second after the whistle. But then when they review it, they do it at the moment that the foul occurs on the review which I, I don't have strong feelings. It's just interesting. It's very different. And that triggers the reset of the clock. And in this case, in this case that happened at 3.0, 2.9 seconds-ish. But the game clock in the arena and the TV clock are not perfectly synced up. So pe- when people were on TV, they're like, wait a second, the clock is at 2.8. How did they get back to 3? It, it, was, just, it was just nuts. It was nuts. I would say you don't necessarily have feelings. Because I feel like if you're going to slow down and check it out, you might as well get everything as accurate as possible. So, you know, whatever. So, yeah, they come down. Marcus Smart takes the, the 
the jumper, which is interesting because we just saw last playoffs last year where the Celtics have the game winner where Smart hits Tatum cutting and he like spins around Durant, I think, and makes the layup at the buzzer. So I was wondering, I was wondering if they were going to do some trickery that way. But no, this time he shoots with just enough time for the offensive rebound. Derek White slips in there for just like, man, what a what a chaotic way, way to win this. But going to game seven, then I think this is the thing that I just I can't get over when it comes to the heat is that you can build this narrative that they're this perfectly coached defensive juggernaut that's able to be flexible defensively. They can cover pretty much anything. Jimmy and Bam allows you to guard literally any kind of position. You have Caleb Martin that can go around and guard positions. Haywood Highsmith comes in. He's picking people off in the passing lanes and things like that. That, By the way, the small ball of Highsmith and, and Butler when Bam was in foul trouble, that's just absolutely hilarious at the end of the first half. But that's not the case. That narrative would be wrong. Like, Miami was making a fair amount of mistakes in Game 7. Like, Jalen Brown, they were in their zone one time. Jalen Brown literally, like, walks to the basket and gets a pass and just, like, scores a layup. Grant, I said Grant Hill before the episode, too. Grant Williams gets a wide-open corner three because Bam and Jimmy miscommunicate in transition. It's not like they were just a perfectly oiled machine in Game 7. So... I don't know. I can theorize and tell you why I think Miami did it, but I think they all just kind of fall short, and it's me just grasping at straws to kind of make sense of this this chaotic run they have. Well, I think that uh, gets us to Denver. I think it builds the drama for Denver because it creates a wide range of outcomes looking at a series like this where you could see on one hand this thinking that Miami is just... They just have it. They're just way, way better. We know they're better than their regular season record. I think that goes without saying. It is, regardless of injuries and regardless of shooting luck, I would say we're now in a place where it's almost impossible for a true like 500-ish team to perform this way against better teams in the playoffs. We're, We're multiple rounds in. But the question then is how much better are they than their regular season? Last year, you mentioned they were a one seed. But remember, they were a one seed, but they weren't the favorite. So there's this very interesting perception of them, even in betting markets, but also analytically. If you just look at the numbers, if you just look at um, you know indicators for, for team success and things like that, they're better than their regular season record. They're potentially much better than their regular season record. But for a series like this, that makes a huge difference where you're going well, in any given year, this is like a nice 53-win team that can knock some people off and they're on a heater right now. That's a big difference between like, this is a championship level, inner circle, here's all the things they do well, you can't take that away, and they can take some of your stuff away. I don't think they're quite that good. Uh, Personally, I think they're obviously better than their regular season record, but I still... I still am feeling like, at least in this series, the place you start is with Denver's offense. And the place you start for Miami most of the time is with their defense. Because I think their playoff defense has consistently, especially under Eric Spolster, but just this version of them the last few years, proven to be very good for two reasons. One, they're really well coached and they have defensive talent. Two, based on that first point, They're very flexible. So they will give you different coverages, different looks. Obviously, the zone, they can switch a lot. You mentioned it. They even tried minutes where they're just like pure small ball. And I I don't even know if the the telecast even is commenting on stuff like that. But it's like they just they don't have big men out there anymore. I think at some point they said Stan Van Gundy did say that they were shelving Love and uh, Zeller. Um, They were going to do that. But it's like this is what they do. And then I look at how that matches up with Denver, and I'm I'm like, well, is that going to give them any advantage in this series? Is that going to slow down Denver in any meaningful way? And uh, I don't know. I have a hard time with that. Can you talk me into that? Do you? Okay. Do we want to move on to the series, or do we want to talk about conference finals MVPs first? Do you want to save that for the end, or do you want to do that and just leave the conference finals behind us? I I do want to move on to the series. I just want to say I probably would have voted for Caleb Martin. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, I just, I just want to, I just want to get that on the record. Caleb Martin did have, uh, for we have series stats that we share with Patreon subscribers at Patreon.com/slash/ThinkingBasketball, and we will update all the series at the end of the year. Caleb Martin did have the best box plus minus 
in the series. He did average a, a quite hilarious 21 points um, on like plus 17 or 18 percent relative true shooting. So his plus minus in the series was fantastic. He basically across the board was better statistically in most categories than Jimmy Butler. And the weird part about it for me, if I had to vote, we did a whole series on conference finals MVPs. The latent value that best players have on a team is so big that usually I go in their direction. But this wasn't a series where it was like Jimmy Butler was demanding defensive attention and just carving up the Celtics. And he couldn't shoot very well. So like his box score stats weren't that good, but he was setting up Caleb Martin and Caleb Martin was hitting threes. That's not what happened at all. Jimmy would just kind of be lost in the flow and the heat offense would just discombobulate and Caleb Martin would be like, give me the ball. I'm going to make a fadeaway three. And it happened over and over and over and over again. And there was some stat that CBS Sports had this morning about like players to score 20 something points per game in a series. I forget the exact number and shoot over 60% from the floor. And the list of players, Cody is like Shaquille O'Neal, Jerry West, Dwayne Wade, Michael Jordan and Caleb Martin are just some, just something silly, just something absolutely silly. So yes, for the record, uh, I think it's time to go to Denver, but for, for the record, uh, I think I would have voted for, for Caleb. Okay. I think, I think the case for Jimmy, not necessarily I'm, I'm taking the case, but I think the case would be Caleb Martin wasn't necessarily creating. He didn't have a lot of creation burden for his teammates. He was doing a lot of the finishing, which, again, when it comes down to a lot of players on your team are struggling, you just need someone to make some shots. That's going to be super valuable. Uh, but Jimmy Butler was doing a lot more of the passing and creation. Jimmy Butler, I also thought, was better defensively. I think he allowed them to go into those much smaller positions. He was much more flexible. Uh, turnovers king. He had like average 2.6 steals per game. And I swear all of them were him just picking Jalen Brown's pocket. Uh, so I don't know. I think if you were to mount a case, it couldn't just be from the scoring. It has to be a combination of the passing, the scoring, and the defense. But, you know, I think it would be fairly close to call. And when it is close, I totally get the latent value thing when it comes to superstars. So I I don't know. I think it was a close one. The the only thing for me, I I think you're absolutely right. I think the only thing for me is it felt weird giving Jimmy MVP after he had like four or five very, what's the diplomatic word? Creaky games. Creaky. Yeah. Like he was, wasn't he five for 24 in game six or something? Did not shoot well in game seven either. It just... It just felt like he was struggling in huge stretches. Jason Tatum, Jason Tatum genuinely annihilated him for stretches in the series. That that stretch he had in the first half of game six, where he repeatedly scored any way humanly imaginable against Butler, and then on the other end destroyed him. One possession, they even tried to post up Butler, and he just took his lunch, which is usually what you see Butler do to other people. That's where it's just like, ah, I don't know. Also, how perfect is it to celebrate this moment, this heat run, by acknowledging that like Caleb Martin has just been this, as our own old friend Bill Raftery would say, onions master in this series. Just big, big shot after big shot. Okay, where were we? The Nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> the onion. I was trying to think of the metaphor. The onion master. I thought, yeah. I, I thought at first yeah. you were like Caleb Martin brought a lot of layers to his game. And I'm like, what? I, I, okay, let's talk about the Nuggets. Let's let's talk about the Nuggets. Well, no. I, let's. St- I want to start with when the Nuggets have the ball mm-hmm. and the Heat are defending them. Um, I mean, first of all, isn't the size a huge factor here? The Heat are very small, right? Are they going to start? They're going to. You think they're going to start Kevin Love? And uh, obviously, Bam, you can think that's going to be the front line, Butler, Love, and Bam. I don't know if they're going to start Love because I think I th- I'm i trying to think of this as if I'm one of the assistant coaches for the Heat. I feel like you always want to have a big man ready to come in because I don't think you can pull off the Butler, Highsmith types of small ball if Jokic is out there. Like, he's just going to offensive rebound you. Like, the amount of Z-bounds that dude would get from there, it would just be unbelievable. The post-ups, like... DeAndre Ayton and Anthony Davis are struggling to contest his, his post-up hook shots and things like that. A, but, a, a Z-bound, by the way, is uh, named after Zach Randolph, where you get your own miss. That's what a Z-bound is. Thank you for clarifying yeah. that. So 
I feel like Kevin Love's going to get a little bit more run. I feel like we might even see Zeller playing a little bit more because they need some more size. It kind of feels like a, a 2000 to 2000, like one, two ish shack. Like we just need to have these big men out there. They're going to like body him up and maybe get a little bit more value. Like ja Jacques Londale. <laughs> I, I legitimately don't even know how to pronounce his name. We've, we've gone too far down that, that rabbit hole, but he was getting value just from like hustling out there and being physical with Jokic, at least for periods of time. It's not like he was like really doing work on Jokic, but I think, you know, love can at least stretch him out a little bit more. I think he adds a little bit more flexibility to an offense that might need some more spacing and he can help get Jokic off the, off the glass a little bit more. So I think this might be more of a Kevin Love, uh, Cody Zeller series than what we just saw against the Celtics. Okay, so Bam is guarding Jokic. Yeah. Kevin Love is guarding Michael Porter Jr. I don't know if they're going to play together. If, who, if Love and Bam Adebayo are going to play together. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be in together. So then who, st who starts? Okay. Am I forgetting a player? I don't know. Who, who'd they start this last game that he did? Who was it? It was it was Bam. They started Jimmy, Martin, Vincent, and Struess. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I so. Don't they know. would start Struess. I think so. <laughs> right? Because then you put Caleb, you put Caleb Martin on Michael Porter Jr. Right? Then you put Jimmy Butler on. I I don't know who. You don't put Struess on Michael Porter Jr. I don't. I'm just I'm just throwing names out. Who's there, gonna ben. guard who Jamal? You, who, who's guarding Jamal Murray? Let's would you start put with Jimmy that. Butler on Murray right away, or would you put? I think Gabe Vincent. You Vincent, could put on yeah. Jamal Murray, right? So Gabe yeah. Vincent's on him. Got Bam on Jokic. Martin on MPJ, maybe Butler. Okay, on, right, right. But I just want to point out we're we're getting down the rabbit hole because we're trying to solve this thing we're brought up in the first place. That's a very small team. The Nuggets are ginormous, so that you're gonna you're gonna start. The lineup they finished the Celtics series with, Bam, uh, Bam is already really small. Michael Porter Jr. is bigger than Bam. What's Bam, like 6'9"? Is he that short? I don't think Bam is that tall. I think that's one of, one of the um, sort of factors to his success mobility-wise. Like, he moves like a very big wing because in some ways he is a very big wing. He's small for a big man. Jokic is, I think Jokic is going to dwarf him. I think so that's I, that's the first place, right? Yeah, I think the key though is is the Heat play bigger than they are, right? Because I don't think like Jamal Murray can necessarily bully Gabe Vincent because he's in for the fight, right? Like Aaron Gordon found some success in past se in past series of just like going down and bullying people to the basket, and I guess like LeBron saw some of that success against the Nuggets, but also LeBron is LeBron, like he's the master of posting up and doing that kind of thing. I just feel like Miami, while they might be a little bit smaller, I think they have at least the requisite size and the desire to, like, fight and, like, the physicality that can make it a little bit more difficult. Because you don't necessarily care about Aaron Gordon, like, posting someone up and being bigger. Like, MPJ, like, his size comes from his ability to shoot over people. It's not necessarily, I guess, maybe with the backside rim protection, he adds some more value. But offensively, you don't necessarily care about him getting it in the post and things like that. So I'm actually not too concerned across the board with Miami's size against the Nuggets. I'm just concerned about their size against Jokic. Okay. Um, by the way, I do, I am seeing things that say Bam was measured at six, eight and three quarters barefoot hmm. that puts him around six, 10 in shoes. Michael Porter is a little bit taller wow. from some of the things I'm seeing. So yeah, I think that first thing for me is just, is just the size. And the second thing is, um, I expect Miami. Well, let me start with something I think Miami will be very good at defending, and that is the transition that we've talked about with the Nuggets. So Jokic grab-and-go damages everybody, but it obviously damaged the Lakers as well because they couldn't set up. We talked about Anthony Davis falling down after he shoots, shoots, shoots his shots. Um, the Heat have a little of that, by the way, too. You know, Jimmy Butler, especially, when he gets down near the baseline, will fall down a lot. He likes to fall down a lot. Um, sort of, you know, the, the, the new thing that the players are doing, every, everybody's doing it. All, all the cool kids are doing it. Cody, they're falling down every time they shoot. So Miami in general, very good in transition defense. And I think because of what we just talked about with Bam, he should be in a position more often, especially if they're not having him post up against Jokic at the basket. He's up at the elbow area or something like that, where you'll take away that element of the Nuggets offense. And they've been killing teams in the playoffs, going defense to offense, their live ball stop offensive efficiency in Denver. That means off a turnover 
and it means off a, a stop with a defensive rebound that's still in play is like 129 or 130 offensive rating and the best in the league this year throughout the regular season in that category was like 124 to put into perspective how good they've been. So I think that's an area where they can have great success in this series, taking away this really, really high value position for the Nuggets. In the half court, the second thing that I was getting to, they are equipped, I think, with guys to chase and move and switch and communicate and handle cuts. So I think that's something that they can also potentially have some success with there relative to some of the other teams that we've seen. But the reason I harp on the size is if you have a small guy guarding Murray, if you have a small guy guarding Porter Jr., and if you have what seems like just about anybody guarding Jokic based on their roster, those are three players for the Nuggets. They're three best offensive players, in fact, who can all comfortably get to their shot whenever they want. And Denver, I'm not saying Denver's playing isolation, but the way Denver plays, what that means is a switch, a handoff, a post up, a back cut, a little handoff at the elbow. If you're not in the right position, they're still going to be able to get their shots. And I'm not sure how many guys in the run that Miami just went through in the Eastern Conference have one player on a team like that, let alone the three best offensive players on literally the most efficient offense we've probably ever seen uh, to this point in the game. So I do think there's areas that Miami can have really good success that other teams haven't had defensively, but that's where the size things. And then you add in the offensive rebounding as well based on that. Um, the cuts they run down near the basket where Jokic is passing the size of those guys, Michael Porter Jr., on catches, for instance, at slips and cuts to the basket. Those, those are all factors. So that's where my mind goes. I'm thinking about, I really like your first point, uh, bringing up the fact that Jokic is able to to bring it up in kind of a five-on-four situation, especially when Anthony Davis would, would either shoot or fall down or something like that. Because even I thought when Anthony Davis didn't fall down, Jokic was just flat out beating him down the court, right? Like, he was just flat out faster. Like, Jokic, when he's going down, he's pretty quick down. He's pretty conditioned in the sense that he's able to do that across the game. Bam! couple reasons I don't think that's going to happen. Number one, he's not going to be shooting as much as Anthony Davis, right? So he's not going to be in that position where he's getting himself set. He's going to be in the position where somebody else shoots and he's able to get back and transition D right away. Number two, he's just faster and has a higher motor than Anthony Davis, right? Like he won't lose in a foot race against Jokic across an entire game. Like I just don't see that kind of thing happening quite a bit. Now, of course, the trade-off there is that Bam isn't really going to be stressing Jokic quite as much as Anthony Davis was on offense, right? He can't get him in any kind of foul trouble. He's not going to be able to take it at him too much. It might even be what the Nuggets want offensively, especially from what we've seen with, with Bam even struggling against smaller players on uh, some of those post, uh, post-up post plays. But I don't know. When I'm thinking about how they're going to end up playing them, Ben, how does it actually look like Jokic catches the ball, you know, a little delay action, Ben. Like, Jokic has the ball at the top of the perimeter. The other guys are kind of doing their movement sort of thing. Are they just going to play him straight up like that? Is Miami going to do some kind of weird, let's double-team Jokic and throw it like a triangle zone behind him? Like, how weird is the Miami defense going to get to try and stop this? Because I think I think their only avenue is really to, to make the half-court defense weird. I'm sad now that it wasn't a sweep. So we didn't have Eric Spolstra in the lab for eight days Mm. trying to cook up you know maybe like some coaches they don't want to try to put anything in that's too complicated they want to go with what got them here but maybe if you just gave him an extra too many days you know like he had too much time on his hands he comes in on day four he's like you know what we should try we we should try a triangle and two that's what we should try we've never done it but we're gonna do it i'm kind of sad we won't get to see that i i do as we talk through it more i do think miami has some ability to defend them reasonably well. Like if you look at the, this is where it gets so weird. You look at the two regular season games, I would say at this point in the season, Denver, especially with Murray, I mean, because remember this is comeback from an injury kind of thing. Denver is the best they've been all year. They are the most well-oiled machine they've been all year. We'll, We'll see how this break treated them you know maybe Jokic spent too much time at the horse stable I have no idea if they're going to be rusty from the layoff but 
All that is to say, in the regular season, the two times they met, the Nuggets still had like 124 offensive rating. I, I think it was 123 in one game and 125 in another game. Jokic has also had a lot of success, I think largely because of his size in the last couple of years against the Heat. I don't know off the top of my head if he has any crazy games. I just, I, I think I've seen every single one of those matchups uh, in the last couple of years when they've met. And he, again, is able to play his game where he's either grinding inside or picking people apart, diming them up, uh, tons of assists and, and highly efficient scoring. So it's one of those things where it's like, I can see the areas where Miami can be better than some other teams. And I can see the theory where Miami with some lineup combinations is able to stall Denver a little bit, especially if the jumpers are off for stretches of games. And that's how the heat steal games. Cause they do that when they hit threes and we'll get to the other side of the ball in a second. But there's also just this thing in my head of like Denver's a machine and Jokic is a machine. And the, the more importantly, the places Denver finds success, it's hard to see how the Heat are going to really chip away at that. That's that's the bigger kind of sticking point for me, if it makes sense. Do you want to switch to the other side of the ball? I would love to. Okay. Would love to. Yeah. So my first thought with this is that the Nuggets actually have the opposite problem of the Miami Heat defensively. Because when Jokic goes to the bench, right, we've seen a lot of the Jeff Green, MPJ, uh, Aaron Gordon sorts of lineup. So like, those are the big guys. Or maybe you pick two of them, right? Especially in this series, I think there's a chance that they could get away with just two of those guys being out there being the big men. And especially, I, I can't stop harping on it, Ben. I really think that the story of Bam Adebayo's offensive struggles, his self-creation, being able to score efficiently, is a huge issue for Miami. And they are not going to win this series unless he's able to generate some more. But from what we've seen with them... When they go smaller like that, I don't think they're going to lose anything defensively. In fact, they should they might actually gain defensively in this series. When Jokic goes to the bench, it might actually be some of their better defensive lineups because they can kind of, I don't know, switch all over the place or not worry about who's posting up uh, or who's getting posted up against whom. So I, I don't know. I think the bench lineups for, for the Nuggets make a lot more sense for Miami. And then I just don't know if the hot shooting for Miami is going to going to continue because like you said Denver's huge I don't think some of the bully ball tactics that Miami is used against like the Celtics and whomever else are going to continue working so uh that's kind of my first thought is I really like the bench lineups in favor of of the Nuggets which is scary because I like the starting lineup lineups for the Nuggets over the heat as well Well, yeah I mean that's the roster construction that the the Nuggets have put together this season um on that end of the court it's interesting if you have uh, the defensive centric lineup, do you have enough offense? I mean, I guess, I guess if Caleb Martin, if Caleb Martin is shooting like 55% from three, I guess that's, that's how you get, that's how you get enough offense. You, you know, the heat in two of the first three games of the Eastern conference finals, their offensive rating was up near 130. And then the rest of the series, um, I will I will pull up where they were last night in a second, but they were under 116, 115. I think they had a 108 in there. So it's this interesting thing where if you get more Duncan Robinson out on the floor for shooting, if you get more Kevin Love for spacing and shooting, you understand how that opens up the potential for the Miami team. We saw it against Milwaukee, right? Sorry, Cody. Um, when I said when I said that, I saw the pain. I saw the pain in Cody's eyes. Um, we saw that against Milwaukee, where it's like, okay, now you've got a team that can be explosive. They have a lot of space. You can see how they score 125 points in a game. But if that can't hold up defensively, then can you get enough? Can you get the explosive shooting from uh, you know the South Beach law firm, the Miami Thrice? Gabe Vincent, Caleb Martin, Max Struess. At this point, we know they can do it, but I also do think they need to be in positions where the shot quality is good to do that. That's a big ask if you're like, no, you just need to do it in isolation, right? You just need to, Max Struess and Vincent and Martin, all three of you, you have made off the dribble pull-up threes in these playoffs and big moments. We need you to do that all the time to have a good chance in this series. And I think a big part of that, Again, talked about a lot. Bam being able to play up, 
playing a lot of those DHO types of actions, doing the dribble handoffs, a lot of the players running around, because I think what they need to do is bring Jokic away from the rim, make him play in space a little bit more, kind of make them work on their rotations. You know, we talk about the shift defense where, you know, we have the next man go over and rotate and then the next person, then you go find the person. If you can kind of get them in those rotations, the Heat might be able to find some of those seams where somebody's open for a jumper. Butler's able to, to drive in for a layup. Uh, you know, Duncan Robinson hits five three-pointers again and drops nine assists or some silliness, right? So I think that's really the key is I think a lot of the offense might need to be generated from from Bam near the top so that Jokic can at least is has to be involved on the defensive side of the court. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. I think that makes sense. That's an area where potentially Miami could find a weak point, find advantages to create. I, the tricky part is the Nuggets defensively, I think, have been pretty buttoned up in the playoffs. And the personnel supports that from the size of Michael Porter Jr. on the back line to Catavius Caldwell Pope, um, Bruce Brown off the bench. Cody, we haven't even mentioned one of the best players for the Nuggets. Uh, we haven't mentioned him in this pod. I don't remember mentioning him in the last pod. I don't know how long we've gone without saying this name. Aaron Gordon. I mean, we're talking about size. I forgot to mention Aaron Gordon. So you've got Jokic, you've got Michael Porter Jr., and then you've got Aaron Gordon. And since we're talking about attacking Denver defensively, I mean, Aaron Gordon has been one of their best and most versatile defenders. They uh, have this hedging system that they use a lot with Jokic. Uh, it's, It's interesting because Denver has some versatility that they've built around Jokic in the middle, So I do agree with you. I think that's an area, an avenue that they could attack potentially, but how successful can they be? Because, you know, we've, we've seen other teams in the West try to do that as well. And it's not that easy. So I wonder, let's get, let's get galaxy brain for a second, Ben. Please. Is this kind of situation going to happen? I'm picturing, you know, the situation I just painted, Bam Adebayo's up top doing some kind of creation stuff, making his beautiful, just the, the tightest bounce passes you've ever seen for a, for a Max Struess layup. Right, it's just, it's beautiful basketball. What if then the Nuggets move Aaron Gordon onto Bam Adebayo, move him up, and then what if Ben? Follow me on this. What if you put Jokic on Jimmy Butler? Right? What if you put him What's there? What's going on? Yeah, Why are we doing think, this? Think about this for a second. What if you put him over there? Right? Because I feel like Rob Williams had you know Rob Williams had some solid success against Butler, and I know Rob Williams is a much better shot blocker he's a much better vertical presence but you know Jimmy Butler's not necessarily the quickest side to side guy is he going to be always blowing by Jokic right is he going to kind of be beguiled into going to iso ball and stagnate some of the Miami uh offense I don't know Ben I think it would be really interesting if we saw that matchup once in a while not necessarily saying the Nuggets should do it all the time but I think that's going to be something we see at some point I was not ready for that level of jump through the galaxy that was a that was a wormhole You took me through right there. So Miami likes to run a lot of pick and roll involving Bam because of his roll gravity. And that is naturally going to bring up his defender, which I think will be Jokic almost all of the time he's out there against the Celtics. They set up a lot of empty side pick and roll with Bam. He can run it with Gabe Vincent. They'll run it with Duncan Robinson. They'll, they'll run it with a lot of people. Jimmy Butler, although Jimmy Butler in the Celtics series at least, was more running pick and roll, I think, to dictate matchups and switch hunt and feel out whether they're going to drop or switch. That's how he, he figured out how he's going to attack. So in the Nuggets case, the first question is, will we ever see a switch in that position? The second question is, will Jokic be in the drop or the hedge? And if he's in the hedge, I mean, I think we know how Denver's going to play that. That's going to ask of the Heat to make certain cross-court passes or make certain concessions, outlet valve stuff. I don't think that's their strength. That, that's, that's the interesting thing. So it's like, if they continue to attack in that same way, I actually thought during the Boston series, as the series progressed... The Celtics had more success defending pick and roll by realizing, like, we need to flood the strong side. We need to bring more players over into the action because you don't see – you're not playing Luka Doncic, right? You don't need to really worry about a guy 
feeling that defense tilt toward him and then shooting it 45 feet into the opposite corner for an open three. Now, it's the Miami Heat, so if they start figuring out how to make those passes during the middle of the series, maybe that punctures that that coverage. But this is where it still gets tricky for me. Um, I will say as we talk through this, I do put some stock in the fact that the regular season games between the teams are competitive, usually. I think this year they were relatively competitive as well. Uh, it's tricky, though, because if the Nuggets, the Nuggets are playing better as a team, and Jamal Murray is, as we've talked about before, playing much better. And so if you don't take that away, I do think you're dealing with just an offense that they have not seen in their Eastern Conference run. And the part we started with today with the variability of like trying to figure out what this team is, if this team, if the Heat were to play basically the exact same way they played on offense against the Knicks, against Denver, similar shots, you know, sim- the, the three-point shooting was whatever in the 30s. Um, offensive ratings were relatively low. They had a hard time getting good shots at times. They would, they would get blown out. They would get completely destroyed. They'd be completely destroyed. So it feels like they need to be offensively in a place where they can at least give the, the law firm guys, the undrafted guys, Duncan Robinson, all those guys, an opportunity to make their threes and then get something, get that, that best of Jimmy Butler. Uh, one more thing as I ramble through this. The Celtics really started to time up Jimmy Butler's scoring game. We had that video on Jimmy Butler that talked about it. Now you think about that. You start seeing that for three, four, five games. You realize, oh, he's going to jump stop. Stan Van Gundy, again, just brilliant observation in last night's game. Early in the game, Butler had two or three moves off one leg instead of a jump shot to throw off the defender. He also had a very quick, almost atypical pull-up on the right side the first time he was switched on Rob Williams. Rob Williams owned him in this series. The good news is for the Heat that Denver does not have anyone like Rob Williams. So you won't have to worry about that. But can you can you get Jimmy in a position where he has favorable matchups and favorable uh, opportunities to create a huge advantage, have these big games, tax the Nuggets, put someone in foul trouble, force their hand, whatever, and then... Is that sustainable throughout the series? I don't know. I would have to go look at the numbers to see how his series progresses throughout his career. But it was really interesting to see most of the Celtics players start to figure out his cadence with the whole up fake jump shot thing. Like at the beginning of the series, just shooting over Derek White. By the end of the series, Derek White is like blocking his shots. And he's like, I, I, think, I, I think I got it down. It's a very interesting thing. So Van Gundy picked up on it, but Ben... I think he was, in a political way, basically saying that Butler wasn't foul hunting a lot in Game 7. I think that's what he was really communicating there. Butler wasn't trying to ram himself into a lot of players. He was actually just looking for his shot. That's that's what was really going on in Game 7. Are you suggesting he foul hunts? <laughs> did, did Game 6 happen? Was the fourth quarter of Game 6 a real thing? That was that was follow hunting supreme, Ben. Uh, we've talked a lot about the series. I'm going to go out there and say that uh, I find this Heat team just really difficult to analyze. Heat so and I'm, six. Oh wow, Cody's. That was your, you're saying Heat and six. I wasn't going to say that actually. Uh, you guys all heard it. Cody I've has got, picked the Heat and six. I, I was going to say Heat sweep. They've got this in the back. No, I I don't actually mean that. Relax, everyone. Um, last year going into Celtics Warriors, I felt like I had a much better grasp on both teams, and I just this wispy smoke. Of this, this, uh, you know, props to my wife coming up with the spicy Nuggets matchup here. It's just the wispy smoke of it that I can't grasp onto. I don't understand how the Heat work. Um, part of me wants to say that the Nuggets are going to sweep them, but I don't think that's. It's either going to be four or five, and I think the Nuggets are going to win in that amount. There is definitely an analytical angle that suggests the Nuggets should sweep them. Mm hmm. Uh, there is also a body of a small body of evidence that has been collected in the last month and a half that suggests the Heat 
are uh, they they are their own special thing, and they will scrap and claw and fight and make games competitive. And I think we talked about this right before we started recording today, so stop me if I've already said it on a podcast. These players, the Caleb Martins of the world, and I don't like doing that, so I'm not going to do it. Caleb Martin, Gabe Vincent, Max Struess, they are not plurals, they are all individuals, okay? <laughs> These are, it reminds me of John Starks. Hmm. It reminds me of Bruce Bowen. Before these guys were known, they were nobodies because they didn't have the pedigree, they didn't have the background, they came from nowhere. And you're kind of doing this thing where you see them play in real time and you acknowledge they're playing well. And there's always like a caveat, like, wow, what a run for an undrafted free agent. And it's like, no, we just did the Eastern Conference Finals. And Caleb Martin has a really good argument as being the best player on the winning team of the Eastern Conference Finals, full stop. There's no caveat needed. So that, I think, the, the name on the back of the jersey sometimes can throw you as much as the name on the front of the jersey. And Martin, clear, like he can clearly play. Like he, He's been very good at times. And you, you, I mean, you just, his shot making in big moments, you obviously trust it. Gabe Vincent, Max Struess, even Duncan Robinson, obviously with the with the shooting, and then you put that next to Bam and Jimmy, and you give them Eric Spolstra. Um, I think there is another body of evidence there that I just outlined that says multiple games will be competitive, and therefore Miami can win just like they did in the Celtics series, one or two of those close games. And then after that, I don't know. I don't know. But it, it, I would not be surprised at all if it's like a six-game series. I, okay. I think – I wouldn't be surprised at all if it's a sweep. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a six-game series. If the Heat go in to Denver and win the first two games, I will be very surprised. <laughs> and, and I will be surprised at how the Heat continue to surprise me. I think what's cool about these two teams is both of them have – have survived some pretty significant mouth punches throughout this this playoff run. Like we saw Devin Booker just – Devin Booker and Durant, I forgot how many points they poured in. Devin Booker was having like one of the best three-game scoring stretches like ever. LeBron James and Anthony Davis. LeBron especially coming out there scoring the most points he's ever scored in the quarter. The Nuggets were down like 15 at some point against the Lakers. Like time and time again, the Nuggets have just like fought back against these. And then Miami – coming back and seeing the disheartening aspect of the Celtics team clawing their way back to game seven and then just blowing them out in game seven. Like that takes so much fortitude on both of these team sides. And I think that's the variable that's really fascinating is we have two teams that have just really toughed it out and shown that they're ready for the big leagues here that, uh, you know, I think, I think Denver more than Boston is ready to stare into the chaos and stare right back into it. And that's that's ultimately what makes me lean uh, Denver in either four or five. There's something I still can't figure out. You were talking about the Heat and their regular season performance versus their playoff performance. The Heat during the regular season, with Jimmy Butler in the game, he played 2,100 minutes. They outscored their opponents by one point per 100 possessions. That's the regular season. In the playoffs, Jimmy Butler's almost up to 700 minutes played. Would you like to guess how Miami, what Miami's point differential is with Jimmy Butler on the court in the playoffs? Oh, I don't know if it's going to be really high or if it's going to be close. I'm going to say it's – oh, I think it's actually kind of low. I'm going to guess like plus three, Ben. It's plus one. No. Yes. I just – this is what I mean. Like there continue to be these things that just make me very confused about what I'm watching – and what's happening. So, um, yeah, I don't know. How have we been talking about this for one hour? I can't believe we've been talking about this, this series for one hour. Is there any other series we have to get to? I mean, besides succession and Barbie, like, I don't know if that's going to be the second hour of this podcast, but that might be where we're going here, uh, for the next 40 minutes or so. What, what, uh, what are your final thoughts on this before we get out of here? And we're going to just, just, we've had some people ask, um, about our recording schedule during the end of the playoffs and the finals here. We're going to try to record. I would like to know that too. Yeah. <laughs> well, we make the videos for every finals game. 
So what's going to end up happening is we're going to have a podcast one or two days after every finals game. So we'll have a show in between the games, but we will not be recording the morning after uh, because we, we as the schedule does not permit that. So we will be later in the next day or or two mornings later, or something like that. We'll we'll figure it out, but we will have shows in between the game. I say that to say we will come back and talk uh, probably on Friday because game one is on Thursday. Is there any anything else you want to get out there on the record? You've already said Heat and Six. Any any other parting shots that you want to give to everyone? I don't know. I think I think I'm done, Ben. I think this is, I just I need this to happen now. We've made it this far. We've built it all up. Let's see what happens in the finals now. Okay, I have a question for you. Ooh. We're at, we're at the part of the show where everyone's tuned out anyway. I can ask you these fun questions. Good. Um, if the Heat win the series. I'm not even joking when I ask this question. If the Heat win the series, this is the best. Is Eric Spolstra the best player since Michael Jordan? <laughs> Do you? <laughs> is this the most valuable playoff run? Do you remember a couple years ago when Brad the Celtics Stevens. with Brad Stevens when the Celtics were overperforming and people were trying to figure out where Brad Stevens is? I mean, like, I'm not even that. I'm not even that sarcastic when I ask it. Like, what? How? How good is Spolstra? I mean, if they just keep it, it just constantly, it's just like ah, we're just going to keep figuring out ways how to win, how to to win playoff series. But also, obviously, all the other things that go into coaching, culture building, system. Um, we don't know a lot about coaching, as we've talked about many times this year on this show, but. There are signals that a coach leaves that you can pick up from the outside. And we can't see all the stuff on the inside, but the signals we get on the outside are things like, wow, Miami really is consistent with how they defend, rotate, communicate um, on offense. Everyone understands the principles. They have this really cool cut under the basket that they do that uh, a lot of other teams don't seem to be doing. They all do it. All that stuff comes from coaching. And they just seem to have that in spades. So I ask of you, where would you rank him on the all-time pantheon if they were to win this? And can he win finals MVP? Okay. Can, can I actually ask you a real question based off that? Like, seriously, though, when it comes to the stuff that we can see and, and uh, judge based on coaching, where does Eric Spolster rank all-time as a coach? Like, not bringing in players, but when you line up every coach in NBA history, he's, he's got to be in the conversation. He's right? in my, yeah, he's in my top 10. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't, again, I don't know how you do that. Do you, do you, do you take into account longevity, creativity, ingenuity? Um, but I will say, you know, a lot of the guys in dynasties, Phil Jackson, Greg Popovich, Steve Kerr, they check a lot of boxes from the outside. They've all done creative things. They've, they've all done stuff within series that has been super, super impressive. And they've all built systems and cultures around star players. How do you judge coaches that are ceiling raisers versus floor raisers that are never going to get those star players? Um, that's where it gets really, really fuzzy. But yeah, I mean, if I, if I had Cody, if someone asked me, you know, if, 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 if they threw it out to me, and they said, for the 75th anniversary, we want you to pick some of your best coaches, right? Maybe 15. Maybe 15 of the best coaches of all time. You know, like, were they, like how many current coaches would you think to include? And I would be like, a person who asked me this question, uh, I think Greg, Greg Popovich, who is the coach of the San Antonio Spurs. And I think uh, Eric Spolstra who is the coach of the Miami Heat. I believe that would be my answer for all-time level coaches that are... Am I forgetting anyone? That's Steve current? Kerr? Steve Kerr. I forgot someone. Yeah, yeah. Steve Kerr. Say. Yeah, thank you. I already mentioned him. I forgot, he, I forgot he's still coaching. So, I mean, obviously we know that everyone's competing for number two because Rick Adelman is probably number one on this, on this coach. Uh, this Don Nelson erasure will not be, will not be tolerated on this show. <laughs> I, I got I got nothing for that. I got nothing. It, it, we should do a Rick Adelman episode when the off season's going. I wonder how many you, people are listening at this point, Ben. Twelve. If you want to if you want to support this show, check out patreon.com slash thinking basketball. Also, 
you can uh, check out and get that discount, uh, sportsbusinessclassroom.com with the uh, promo code Thinking Basketball. That is it for this one. We have made it to the finals. We will talk to everybody, all 12 people who are still listening after game one. Um, thanks as always for listening to this one, and I hope you're having a great day.